I'll tell you what, it, it, it is a really different day. It's February 22nd, 1991. I'm in the Pentecostal Research Center, and I'm John D. Nichols. Nichols is a executive committee, a member of almost every important uh, governing board of, has been uh, a member of almost every important uh, governing board of the church, a man of great ability and skill, and I might add a very dear friend. Thank you very much for coming by, uh, Brother Nichols, and uh, visiting with me. And uh, I know that being a member now of the executive committee, you are very busy, and to take time off to come by and have this conversation is very, very uh, gracious of you. Brother Nichols, I became strongly aware of you way back in the 1950s, I believe. You were in Alabama at that time, uh, pastoring in uh, Birmingham, the Birmingham area. But I noted then some characteristics about you that have uh, come into sharp focus in later years and have been a great benefit to the Church of God. But you were not a Southerner. You were, you were not a native of Alabama. Where really did you uh, begin your ministry? Uh, my father was uh, an Assembly of God minister, and he was uh, pastoring an Assembly of God church in Manhattan Beach, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. And uh, while he was pastoring there, I was born in 1929. Now, was he a Pentecostal man? Oh, yes. Uh, even, yes. even at your birth? Yes. So you were born into a Pentecostal, a Pentecostal home? Yes. All you ever ever knew then was Pentecost. That is, and that is correct. My dad was a, a pastor at that time, at, and then we ran into some difficult times uh, as it relates to the ministry. And uh, my father got a civil job. Uh, it was interesting in that he wrote to uh, Mrs. Theodore Roosevelt and uh, was telling about his plight. And she personally intervened with a letter, and he was uh, hired in Seattle, Washington, on. Uh, Silver service. So he spent a number of years in that kind of work and then went back to pastoring again. So a, mm -hmm. a majority part of my life was involved in pastoring. And you remember the days when he was pastor and yes. you lived in a parsonage? Yes, uh -huh. very much so. Well, it, that's in California and uh, right. now then you're right in the heart of the South, which is the strength of the Church of God. How, how was it to be a child in a Pentecostal home in California in those days? Uh, I found it very rewarding. My dad um, was a very tolerant man. He was not a, on, on, there are 10 of us. I'm the 10th child. So by the time he got to me, he was much more mellow than <laughs> he was with the first ones. And uh, so I have very pleasant memories. And to me, the ministry is a very positive thing, always has been. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have pleasant memories of being in the parsonage, uh, no real severe conflict with uh, the ideology of the church or anything like that. So I have good memories. So what, what about the uh, attitude of the outside when, that you encountered at school or in the town? Or? No, because the, uh, uh, during those very sensitive years of my life, he was an associate pastor with my uh, brother-in-law. And uh, he pastored a very prominent church in Whittier, California, and the church was well recognized in the city. So it was on the border, if not a prestigious assignment mm -hmm. that he had at that time, which mm -hmm. reflected in my relationships. Well, did you begin preaching in the Assemblies of God? Yes, I took my training with them. Uh, when I was... Uh, when I came out of the Marine Corps, in fact, I, I received an early discharge so I could start school, and I was saved. Well, this is after World War II. Yes, it was between uh, the, right at the end of the Korean War, actually. Even then. Maybe between Korean and Vietnam. I was very uh, lucky in my timing in that I was in the service in between the conflicts. I was too young for World War II and uh, too young for even the Korean War, but then at the end of the Korean War, I. 17 years of age and went into the mm. service. And then while I was in the service, in the Marine Corps, I was converted. And then um, 
I was called to preach and decided to go to Bible college. And so I went to the Assembly of God Bible College called Southern California mm -hmm. College, and now in Costa Mesa. And I took about um, oh, two and a half, almost three years of training with them. And, you know, uh, the uh, superintendent Woodworth of Southern California preached his first sermon in my dad's church in Colorado. And his wife was my father's, what they call their CA, their young people. He was my father's uh, you know, CA director. So, and, you know, they would, they would share with me that I had a, a bright future with them. And uh, they were very interested in me because of the relationship with my father. And then my brother-in-law was the developer of the, um, of the Bible College campus. And he had also served as the CA director for Southern California, so he was very prominent. But I, I met my wife and the Church of God at the same occasion. Was she Church of God? Yes, very much so. Oh, oh yes. In fact, our first date, uh, I took her to a Chinese restaurant, and uh, I was Assembly of God minister at that time. And she looked across the table and said, uh, something you need to know. I'm Church of God from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, and I'll never be anything but Church of God. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's been her uh, outspoken attitude <laughs> yes, uh, right. all the way through, hasn't All it? the way through. Oh, all that is very, very interesting. And did uh, that truly begin your inclinations toward the Church of God? Yes, uh, but it was a spiritual experience uh, because I there was so much invested in, in the direction I was going at that time and so much interest in my ministry, and I was speaking at a lot, lot of the uh, larger churches in the area at the time. And it was a, uh, during a time of devotion, and uh, I was praying, and the Lord definitely directed me to the Church of God and said that my ministry would be in the Church of God. Mm -hmm. And so I began to pursue it, because that was a direction from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you, the actual decision come about? Uh, the Santa Ana Church um, was uh, Which is the old uh, church. There. The old church, the old Santa Ana. And John Douglas Jr. was the mm -hmm. pastor of that church at that time. And uh, I started attending the church because I had received this experience from the Lord. And uh, I, I, I really fell in love with it. I, I love the fellowship and I love the preaching and, uh, and the worship celebration worship services they had. Mm -hmm. So I, I fast became Church of God. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what differences uh, did you observe in the Church of God and the Assemblies of God from, uh, say, practical uh, points of view? Well, there were several things that, that, um, that I compared that uh, became obvious to me. One was, at that time, uh, Church of Gods were uniform. What you would see in one Church of God, you pretty well saw in another Church of God. Mm -hmm. And I particularly, at that point in my ministry, liked that. Well, yes, that, that was a strong uh, a point of security, we yes, might say, for right, all of us. Right. Yes. And, and you, you felt free to, to go to any church and, and, and preach because you know they were pretty much this, the same. What, what, whatever, whatever your beliefs were, they, they would have the same. They were there. And that, that particularly affects me. Another one, strangely enough, was um, the teaching on sanctification. Um, I, I, I remember being quite upset sitting in a service and hearing them say, I'm glad I'm saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and a member of the great Church of God. And that would upset me. And so I set out theologically as a young preacher to prove them wrong in sanctification because my father had taught me that uh, you never say you are sanctified, you say you're in the process of being sanctified. And, uh, and that particular doctrine had tremendous at, uh, attraction to me. And so I did a lot of studying because I was in Bible college. You, when you say attractive, not because you were acceding to it, but no. because you found it interesting. I found it interesting, very interesting. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then I got into it and, and it had a, uh, it was a very positive thing because it was an opening of a teaching mm -hmm. that had been pretty much left dormant in, in, mm -hmm. in my other uh, exposures. So that teaching of sanctification 
uh, was a very exciting part of my relationship with the Church of God. Now, that, that was one of the uh, strong uh, distinctions between the Assemblies of God and the Church of God, that we believed strongly, preached strongly, that uh, sanctification was a second definite work of grace. We always would put that second in there. Then there were <clears throat> another that was in the practical side was the matter of uh, uh, feet washing. Yes. Did you encounter any? Yes, and I, I, I had already accepted that uh, in my theology. And when I found that the Church of God believed that, it really made me feel good. Uh, in other words, you independently had come yeah, to Yeah, I had come to that, that. And, and would argue in the classroom uh -huh. very vehemently about that they should practice it and uh, was involved in several debates in college on it. And then mm -hmm. when I found a church that practiced it, Here you find that, that I, was, I was really happy about that. Mm -hmm. And about sanctification, uh, you, uh, the one who really nailed it down for me was Brother B.E. Ellis, old Brother Ellis. Basil Ellis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, his dad. Is it E.B. or? No, that would be E.M. Ellis. E.M. Ellis. Yes. Preached the Washington camp meeting mm -hmm. when I was a young evangelist. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I totally agree with his uh, theology. Oh, but he was, he was stern. He was and strong. Very strong. Right? And when you left, you left with an opinion, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, he, he, had, he was very, very much a part of, uh, of my uh, crystallizing some so of So you thoughts. actually came to know one of the old war horses yes, of that, that era. I, I can remember Brother uh, Ellis preaching and quoting entire chapters of mm -hmm. Peter and, and other books and and I, as a young preacher just starting out, just sat just totally enthralled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But were you assigned to a church uh, to pastor in uh, California? Yes, my first church was uh, uh, in Visalia, California. And uh, that was way back in 1952, along in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But you didn't stay there very long then. No, no. Uh, it was a kind of an interesting situation. Uh, the district pastor was Harold Thompson, and Brother Ramsey was the state overseer. H.B. Ramsey. Yes, H.B. Ramsey. And, and Brother H.B. Thompson was the district overseer, wanted me to pastor that church. They wanted someone else. But he persuaded them that they ought to have me as a young preacher. And uh, when I got there, I found out they wanted the other person. And so I insisted that uh, that the overseer give consideration to this congregation. Mm -hmm. And so I just stayed a few months and at my own determination left there because I felt I, that congregation wanted that other man and he went and had a successful ministry there. Well, in, in, in a way, <clears throat> that was a sign of the progressive attitudes that uh, we were all going to become aware of in you even then. Because back then, what the state overseer said was law. I mean, if he sent you a man to the church to pastor, that's what happened. The uh, congregation had little to say about it. That's true. But, uh, of course, we'll get to that a little later, that those things have been moderated and modified through such voices and influences as yours. But uh, then what brought you to Alabama? Uh, I felt that at Baldwin Park, where I had been for five years, and we had had good growth, church had doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and, and became one of the leading churches in California at that time. But I felt that my ministry was, was um, pretty well terminated there. I just had a, a sense of that. And H.D. Williams, the, the old mm -hmm. soldier, uh, brother, was a member of my church. Yes. And um, so H.D. came out and preached one of our big celebration services that we had. And of course, uh, I became very close to H.D. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was involved in my life at an early stage. And uh, he was a friend to a brother, Carl Green, who was in Birmingham, Alabama, and knew that Carl Green wanted to go to California. So he talked to me about that. And I, I ask that we have several months of prayer about it to make sure it was God's will. And uh, after about three months of waiting before the Lord, both Brother Green and I felt it was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we worked it out. And I came to Birmingham, Alabama mm -hmm. from Baldwin Park, California. But now, in that time that you were in Birmingham, the uh, church was 
really wrestling with the uh, external proofs of holiness, of the very thing that you were convinced of, and that was the matter of sanctification. But the external compliance with the things that made us holy. And I remember that it was in that period that yours was a very uh, challenging voice to some of the extremities that the sum would go to. And yours was a very clear voice in, in the garble that came because there were some people that may have been, it seems uh, to me, on reflection even more strongly than it was then, though I did recognize it then, <clears throat> that they were espousing perhaps views they did not really hold because it seemed to be a popular thing to do. And you were one who was willing to speak out and to uh, question things that were kind of sacred uh, to some of our people. And I might say uh, still they are because in the course of my conversations uh, that I'm now doing, I've encountered uh, some of that. But who, who, was, uh, who influenced you? What there, there were two, two people that really influenced me. As a young, um, zealous preacher, when I came into the Church of God, I was influenced strongly by um, men like M.E. Drake, who was old line, almost exclusivism uh, in the Church of God. And now this is the father. This is the of father the two sons. of the two sons. And mm -hmm. so I was going down that path very hard and very strong. I was um, I, my zeal was drawing people to our church, uh, and my preaching and and uh, fervency of worship. But my dogmatism was driving them out the other end of the door. And um, uh, it, the two men that affected me was R.P. Johnson and, and Charles W. Kahn. Uh, mm, what an what <laughs> unexpected uh, statement and compliment. Thank you. Uh, Brother uh, R.P. Johnson, who is related to Brother Ralph Williams, and Ralph Williams was my state overseer at that time, had Brother Johnson come and spend some time with me in Baldwin Park. And he, in his sensitive, detected my dogmatism, almost my fanaticism, and my zeal. And, and so he started working on me, and I didn't realize he was working on me. And we would go out for long drives in the car, and he would talk to me about the, what the early fathers of this church really meant by some of the things that they were that, uh, that they put in place and how that those have been mistreated and misunderstood and abused. And um, he, ex for instance, the ring situation. He was the wedding a, band. The we're wedding band, mm -hmm. yes. He was very clear that the, ne the fathers never intended for that to be. It never was so. Never it was. Never was. Never was. And he explained that to me. And all of us, for the first time, I began to realize that um, that maybe what I was hearing was not was not the Church of God. It wasn't a matter of being loyal to the Church of God. Maybe it was just an idea that was inside of the Church, and that the Church was not really birthed to give that kind of dogmatism. And so, as a young man, I mm -hmm. I began to examine my whole theology and my all of my dogmatism. And then, uh, when I came into Birmingham, you were the uh, morning Bible teacher. Mm -hmm. And your whole week was on love, and I, and and that's when you begin to first—I don't know first, first time I heard—you begin to introduce into the church that holiness is not hardness, mm -hmm. and you were very strong on that, and you were pitched uh, against a person who was very hard. And you were in the morning session preaching on this love, and I was watching and listening. Mm -hmm. And the other person on the evening service was very hard. And so I had, a, I had one of the most beautiful opportunities to see the contrast. And, and, and I came out of that camp meeting crystallized that, that holiness was not hardness, and that it was not something that you put on, it was something that you lived. It was mm -hmm. something that you expressed, and it was manifested in multiple ways. And I, I remember very well your illustration on love and the multiple facets of love. Mm -hmm. And you talked about a stone, 
yeah. or diamond, and the, the reflections of the diamond. You, you yes. would, I'm sure you would, because I, I wrote you and tried to get you to send me that sermon, and you wouldn't do it because you were going. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have an outline. <laughs> but, uh, but though you too, R. P. Johnson was very vital in getting me to question what was the real mission of the church, and I began to realize it wasn't to try to beat people up. Mm -hmm. And and that began to change my philosophy. And then you were very involved in me crystallizing that. Now, uh, Brother Nichols, do you uh, see the Church of God as coming to a place of greater maturity? Is the new, what some would call tolerance, or uh, a little more leniency toward those who hold opposite views? Is that a sign of maturity or is it a sign of weakness? I'm convinced that diversity is a sign of maturity. And I think the Bible supports it strong. And uh, uh, so I, 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 I rejoice. I rejoice when I looked on the council a number of years ago, the executive council, and saw the extremes that were sitting on that council, uh, men who uh, were very hard and men who were in our terms very liberal and the same body of men put both of them in that council and I, I saw then that we were breaking and beginning to respect uh, the diversity of the church and so uh, what drew me to the church uh, at first in, in its oneness and in, in, in one kind of a mold uh, later, I learned to appreciate when we broke that mold and we allowed more individual expression. And I'm convinced that the church is not to be a box of matches with every head lying in the same direction, but it's to be a growing, beautiful vine with individual expression. Well, that's an interesting way of, uh, of uh, stating it. Now, <clears throat> you have been one of the strong voices in uh, this progressive mode. It is certainly not slacking. It certainly is not in any way uh, softening a position of godliness Absolutely. in our lives. But it's a, an awareness that if Jesus didn't do it, we should not. He said that uh, we're washed by the water of the word. And uh, we're not to try to do it by beating people over the head. Well, you took that strong position, and yet, and yet, you won the confidence, the esteem, even the deep affection of some of those who were the most outspoken in, in the thing that you were speaking against. And that was always to your uh, credit that you were able to maintain that balance and that love. But in, in uh, the period <clears throat> of your ministry before you uh, went into administration, you were strongly evangelistic in your in your ministry and your approach and your thoughts and so on were you were you really an evangelist at heart I believe that's my calling uh, I've had different you think your ministry yeah. gift would really be that of yes um, I I've always wanted to be a teacher because I, the opposites always attract mm -hmm. and uh, uh, men such as yourself and others that have a, a teaching gift I have, I have um, coveted because I think it is so tremendous. But uh, when I get behind the pulpit, it's an evangelistic. I I reach for decisions. I I can't preach without reaching, even if it's to the Christians. Whereas a teacher, I find, uh, you know, believes works in the process of the person and growing, and this isn't, isn't all. I don't know if that's the definition of an evangelist or not, but there's something in my calling yes. that just demands that I, I I bring people to some kind of a decision in, mm -hmm. in, in what they do, and I don't know if teaching is just. Uh, you could probably explain that better than I can. <laughs> but, well, but I do feel like I'm an evangelist. Well, I, I, I quite agree. I quite agree because the Lord has put such a stamp of effectiveness upon your ministry in that. You would, you would go on uh, from the point that we have brought you to. 
and you would be overseer of uh, various states, and you would become uh, a person of considerable leadership ability. And finally, the time would come that you would be elected to the executive council, and finally, to the executive committee itself. When, when did you first come on to the council? 1972. I, uh, that's a day that you never forget. It, no, you don't you forget that. You never day. forget the day I was so nervous and when my name was finally placed in as one of the council members. Uh, I was so nervous, I couldn't even sit down. I, I would have to get up and walk around, and, and I was afraid to go to the platform prematurely, and I, it, it, I was almost in, a, in another world, because that, that has to get, to, to feel like you have been true to your convictions and you have stood for what you believed, and then to get the recognition of your peers, uh, it's, it is a, a, a joy. You know, that, that, is, that is a sobering time for a man. I remember a man by the name of T.W. Godwin was elected to the executive council in uh, 1952, I believe it was. And I saw him uh, shortly after the election. I had been elected that same year. And he described to me this feeling of wonder, of awe, and of responsibility that out of all the thousands of ministers, that he was one of 12 who had been elected to the uh, Council of 12 it was at that time. Now, in that uh, time that you were on the uh, council and you served, you began to show a different side than I had ever seen before. And I think that many others had ever seen. And this was a degree of compassion, a degree of uh, understanding of other people. And you championed sometimes uh, causes that others were not in. But you, if you saw an underdog being ill-treated, others in, in authority were taking some advantage of a man. And uh, that, that's, that's another subject the church has been addressing in later years too, people who abuse authority. You could be counted on to be on the side of the underdog. Well, of the man that was not doing, being treated fairly. That's one of the finest compliments I think I can, I can receive because I think that's what Christianity is about, not how you respect your superiors because if you're smart, you're going to do that. And even if, you, if you're smart, you're going to respect your, your peers because it, it, it enhances fellowship. But to me, Christianity is reaching to the, the man that is hurting and doing something for him that doesn't enhance your position. And so I think that's the finest compliment you can give me. Well, that, that is something that's very, very obvious. And the result is that you have an entire cadre of younger men that look to you as a champion, that look to you as someone that can gain an entrance to forums that they might not be able to, and yet be able to uh, persuade and, and to help. There is, there is, whether we admit it or not, sometimes a dichotomy between the older and the younger. The older seem to look with some scorn upon the younger, and they're, they're young, they, they're still wet behind the ears. I know I was called, along with Raymond Spain, by one of our venerable old leaders, the Knee Pants Boys. And that's pleasant memory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but there is this attitude of some discountenance of men because they're young. Then on the other hand, there are some young men who cannot tolerate or abide the old. They think they're duffers. They think they uh, don't have much to offer. And as I had a man say to me some uh, time ago on the executive council, 
said, uh, Brother Gon said, we've been talking, or who was talking, I don't know, and we decided that there's some good for people like you and Brother Cross to be on the council. <laughs> In other words, how charitable. we tolerate you. Yes, 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 it's very charitable. But you, and this is not intended to be a compliment. This is a, an assessment of, of a role that uh, your own inclinations have brought you to and God now has thrust you into, of uh, bridging that uh, generation gap. Well, I, I, you know, you mentioned that, that I had received the, the vote of people uh, the, the support of people uh, with opposite views, and and I thought the moment you said that I thought I think it's because of the same reason that I support many people who are my opposite views because I detect in them that it's sincere that it's not game playing. There are some people that that do not agree with me or in my theology. Are my ideology, but I, I I believe that I believe they are so valuable because they are the balance in the church, and they are they make such a, a, a balancing contribution to the church, and they're real. I think the only thing that I can't stand is game playing, you know, or yes. you know, and and that that makes you want to spit on the ground. It you know, does, it you know, does. Game playing. We, but, and so when I see in a man, you know, uh, this genuineness, uh, I'm just drawn to him. And, and, and I think that's probably the reason I have such respect for men like yourself and others. Brother Cross is one that I have tremendous respect for. You know, well, he was a great man. Uh, and I would sit on the council with Brother Cross and, and probably be at the opposite end of an argument. But when I got through, I admire him more. Mm -hmm. Even if, if 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 his argument won and I was beaten up, mm -hmm. I would still admire him more because he was you know he was he was a true no. church statesman. Well, that that was one of the rather interesting things. There's one other that I might have differed with more, but I suppose we were both uh, in our later years. We went on the council in the same year, 1952, and uh, we've been on the same number of years and so on. But I suppose no two counselors have ever, over such a span of time, been on opposite ends of the line. But yet we were close personal friends and uh, we just differed in some of our uh, attitudes and some of our opinions to things. But in all of it he was a Christian. Yes. Oh, he was a tremendous man and I miss him very much. I miss James A. Cross very, very much. Yeah. And I'm delighted when I see men like you who are coming on and are beginning to show now the kind of maturity, and I, and I don't mean this in a demeaning way, please understand that, but you, you, you come to the point that older men come to, the only thing that brings you to it is by living a while. So you've been on the council a long, long time. What, how do you compare the executive council now and the council when you first came on it? Well, I think the chemistry is really interesting because um, uh, of the measures that place certain people, uh, pastors outside the continental U.S., these, these are the measures that we have passed. Uh, I think it's a totally different council. I, I don't compare them. I mean, I, I do compare them, but I, I don't see a lot of similarity between the council in 1972 and the council we have now. Council of 1990. Yes. This uh, is 1991, but they were elected in 1990. Yes, and, and uh, I, don't, I, I see very little similarity because uh, of the pastoral input. Uh, while I, I, I rebel at the idea that, that we nominate certain people for position. That bothers me tremendously. Uh, it has been, uh, I think, a very good thing to bring these young pastors on and let them challenge uh, the church. Mm -hmm. And they are doing that. And it is fun to watch mm -hmm. them because they are, they are committed to the church and they are, they are not intimidated by leadership while they yet respect leadership 
and they have a reverence for it. I think a, a true balance for it. Yet they are. They, well, I think they're deeply respectful. Yeah, I do. I sense that. Yes. I sense that. <clears throat> but they are also not intimidated, and they they <laughs> say mm. it like it is. And I, I appreciate that challenge to the church. I hope the day comes when we don't have to say so many of this and so many of those and so many of these people on the council that, that we are intelligent enough to vote people that we want to vote on the council. But right now it's a refreshing mm. experience. Now, uh, Brother Nichols, your mention of the uh, people from other countries being now elected to the council. A number of years of your life you have spent in the interest of uh, world missions as chairman of the missions board and you were always very uh, uh, progressive in that. Well, you've been progressive in everything that you've done. What, how do you see <clears throat> this reaching out that the church is doing? We speak of it as internationalization. Do you think this is going to uh, bear well with the church? or I think it's going to be very difficult for the church. I think they're going to struggle with that as much as they've struggled with anything that they've ever struggled with. I'm now changing my term and my thinking from international to globalization. Uh, I really think that's more accurate, that we are becoming a one uh, global unit. And uh, it's happening in the world, and, uh, and it's got to happen in the church. And uh, it cannot be delegated to uh, a, a department. The globalization must be the responsibility of the whole church. And uh, and so I I I resist tokenism. Very, I, I think that is mm -hmm. an insult mm -hmm. to integrity, tokenism. Mm -hmm. And I think that to 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 say that you really want a truly international church or a true glo global church, and do not give uh, opportunities of uh, leadership and uh, potential. Uh, general leadership by election to anybody and everybody, if you don't really pull them into the decision-making process, uh, to me that is where we have to move to if we're going to be truly a, a global church. But if we don't move in that direction, I think uh, we will stun our growth. I think we will end up again back into another form of exclusivism. and. Uh, and, and, and until we reach out and pull everybody in and they are a part of the decision making and a part of the total operation of the church, uh, uh, until we do that, I think we will have failed. Be very well, are, are we moving in that direction? Yes. Uh, our last executive council meeting, I thought, spoke to us very strongly about that. And uh, uh, I, think there are, I think we can do it. I think we're tough enough to do it. Uh, one thing, that Brother Khan, that I want to go on record for is, is I am amazed at the tenacity of this church. I'm mm -hmm. amazed at the fiber of this church. What other organization could go through the financial changes that we've gone through mm -hmm. and gone through the teaching of our, our teachings and our practical commitments and and those kinds of uh, changes that we've made and still have the kind of unity that we have in this church. This is a tough church, and mm -hmm. I think we can do whatever mm -hmm. we really put our heart to do. Mm -hmm. so it'll be an educational process. We could call it a church built on the rock. <laughs> yeah, it's a <laughs> cornerstone church. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, in, in uh, the fact that, due to the fact that many countries are in no way attached to the United States. This is where the church began. This is where its uh, international headquarters uh, stands. But uh, beyond that, they have no real connections here. And we, are, we see a growing number of churches, I mean, uh, yes, churches within one country sending missionaries to still another country and they don't come by Cleveland. They don't right. come through here. That's right. They send out missionaries to the, uh, the other. I think, I think we're headed in a very, very good direction in which uh, each, each area 
is going to feel its own responsibility. Absolutely. And it, it, for us not to do that is to nurture this great father, of the great father deal that we will oversee all, at all. And I think that's one of the things that, that is the challenge of the church is to distinguish between centralized, a truly biblical sense of what centralized government is. I think we have got them confused with the parental attitude as opposed to a truly centralized church. I don't think a, a, a church that is biblical, biblically based, can be anything other than central. But I think we have confused the two. And, and we think that parental is a definition of central. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an extremely good challenge. And one other thing on this whole globalization, I am convinced that we will see the change, the turning of the corner come when the United States has its own assembly and deals with its own problems. Mm -hmm. I think that will be the major turning point. You know, the, the Executive Council has been uh, considering that for quite a while, and I'd like you to just kind of spell that out because uh, this conversation may be viewed in later years, and I'd like uh, that whole concept to be spelled out, if you don't mind. Well, I, I, I'm convinced that, that it is a tragedy that the United States has uh, passed measures and and that at its general assembly, at its general assembly mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they become global responsibility and they are mm -hmm. really particularly our problems or our challenges mm -hmm. in the United States and uh, and that 90 plus percent of everything we discuss at a general assembly relates to us and uh, I think that in itself 98 percent did you say? I, I, well, I, 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 that's I, not a precise figure. No, it's not a precise figure. <clears throat> I think it ranges anywhere from 90% on up. I see. Uh, right. uh, that it relates to us and not to the real needs of... Uh, and yet we bring in delegates from all over the world and they hear... They listen to purely us. ...purely United States problems. They listen to us spend two or three sessions on our pension program or on our insurance program or are on these various things that they have no, no, and, and then I think there are some things that if we had a general assembly that was specifically for the United States, I think there are some things that we could face in our structure, in our, uh, in our, in our entire organization that we would, we would feel free to face and to deal with, to help us to, to catch up in the United States on how, see, I, I have a, a, a genuine concern like you do that 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 our energy and our money should be maximized we should get a high percentage of positive results from our money and from our energy and I'm convinced we're not doing that because we're dealing with a structure that that uh, is encumbered because of the internationalization I think we need to work with our nation with our problems and not have an international audience when we do it, that we ought to deal with the things that affect us. And if we can ever do that, I think that we will be on the road to true internationalization. We will, we, will, we will adopt a structure that will meet our needs in the United States of America. Then we will adopt a structure that will be international mm -hmm. and that will get input from, from everybody else. And then the United States will become one of many voices in that international mm -hmm. body that is functioning mm. to take care of the international needs. And, and we will have our input just like uh, Germany or somebody else will have Now input. these other countries do have their uh, national They deal uh, with their citizens. problems, their unique problems without any kind of interference. France deals with theirs, Germany deals with theirs. Argentina. Argentina with deals with theirs. And, and here we are doing our work. We have no vehicle we have to no deal vehicle. on the national level with our problems. And so therefore we are, are, all of our thinking is affected by that and, and our decision making is affected by that. And uh, so to me that's the key. If, mm. we, if we can turn that corner and deal with our, our own individuality as a nation like every other nation is doing. Well, are we moving toward it? Uh, yes, I feel very good about what I see coming down the road. Mm -hmm. I, I think we can do it. I, th I think it's going to be tough because I think people are going to be threatened because of insecurity. Uh, they can see a, a Mexican general overseer. They can see a Puerto Rican general overseer. 
because they they've never thought or of it. or a Korean or Indonesian, Indonesian or see. Filipino yes and that frightens them and yes. and and then they, they they it frightens them they think well we're paying the bill but you know I submit brother Khan that if you pay 10 percent you know you're paying your part of the bill no matter that, where you are wherever you are yeah, exactly, well, and 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 so it's not a cumulative thing. That's, that's right. right. It's, you're still paying the same. If you're paying ten percent in America, you're, you're paying the same thing that the fellow in Korea is paying. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody's paying their part of the bill. Mm -hmm. So we but can do it. Now this would necessitate a uh, change of venue from the United States, occasionally, perhaps uh, more than half the time, to other localities for our General Assembly. But that will be another difficulty because the great preponderance of uh, national membership is in the United States. Now, the membership in the United States is less than the cumulative uh, membership in the rest of the world, yes. but there is no single country that uh, can match it. So if it were to go, if we were to have a general assembly in another country, it would have to be someplace like Indonesia, where the largest congregation in the Church of God exists, in Surabaya, and uh, very few others. Mexico could uh, have a very fine uh, yes. general assembly. But that, that'll, be, that'll be one of our big challenges in, in doing that. But you see, if we set up our structure in the United States and we have our national overseer, which will be housed in our building, you know, because that is virtually our building. It's been paid by, by, by Americans. And we had him housed there. And he's there and in place. The world wouldn't collapse if there was an Indonesian, Indonesian general overseer because he could remain where he is and function as the general overseer of the Church of God and meet, you know, on, on a certain basis with the Church. And, and we will continue as a nation because we have our national overseer. Or our national overseer could be elected as the general overseer of the entire sure. church. And yeah. he, so he can remain where he is and use the facilities that he but has. But it's almost uh, dead sure it will happen that way if, if it's always in America. It's always in America. Now, Brother uh, Nichols, <clears throat> there are always particular times and... Uh, decisions that are made and these are the swivel points of the of, of the uh, church and I think I have a pretty good uh, idea at least what I think are those things of the past you've been on the executive council almost non-stop since maybe non-stop since 1972 and what in your view is the the most significant decision the church has made in that time? Well, I think it has to be the uh, the decision with our practical commitments. I think. It well, was now I, we're in agreement on that. I, I had an idea you might say that, though I didn't know. Yeah. Because uh, I want I want you to explore that just a little bit because this has sent a. Um, little tremor, I think it is a little tremor, of uh, anxiety across much of our country and maybe in other parts of the world. But what do you see we did when we adopted this large body of, um, of practical commitment, teaching, and uh, elucidation? Were we lessening our stand or were we undergirding it? One of the uh, traits that people constantly give me is bottom line. I always go for a bottom line. Mm -hmm. I think the significant thing is we became honest and dealt with what we believe to be biblical. And, and I think that that set us on a course that allows us to look at other things that that need to be dealt with, very, very s severely dealt with, uh, as it relates to structure, as it relates to relationships. I think I think putting that in place gave us a stand and a spirit of honesty and and openness 
that that here to heretofore had, had not really been. I think we had. I, I I think personally that we had. We were playing games. We would go to our churches, and on our platform, and in our leadership, all of the violations of those practical commitments were being exercised. And we were pastoring those churches, and then we would go to the General Assembly and fight like tigers to keep them in place. And then go back to our churches and tolerate them. And, and when we made that decision, I think we said to ourselves, more important than we said to anybody else, let's be honest. Let's get to, back to the Word. Let's, no matter, no matter what or how it affects, let's let's verbalize uh, what we believe God is saying to the church and we have a beautiful document in place that I think is encompasses everything mm -hmm. uh, that some felt that we have lost and, and much much more so you know I, I just I'm just saying that honesty is the greatest thing I think that came mm -hmm. out of that I think it's good but I think it's going to lead us to greater things well I think you touched on something a moment ago that bears on this uh, thing as well. And to put, put it in perspective, let me uh, state that for years, um, I could almost tell you how many years, with just a moment to calculate I could, we have come to view a body of teachings as ironclad, rigid, inflexible, and these, when, when, you, when you retreat to something like that to, because of some feeling of, that we lose ground not to do it, then you, you give that a force of law. In 1909, 1910, when the teachings of the church were first codified, they were given as guidelines. They were given as guidelines that would uh, encourage people to attain to the uh, perfection of doing these things. But over the years, they became crystallized and, and, and ironclad. So when this new step was made, I see and I'm not giving my opinions, I don't want to, I want to be getting yours. We were returning to a pristine day when we recognize that you cannot enforce things, you can only attain two things, and by the preaching of the Word, and by the involvement in the Word, be able to, uh, to attain them. Now, I see that in that regard, we have made great, great uh, progress. And, and it might, had to be the feeling of the Executive Council because they are the ones who voted it in. Then it had to be the opinion of the uh, General Council because they voted it in, and of the General Assembly because they voted it in. But do you still feel as comfortable as uh, you're, you're out there now and you're going around the church and you hear the uh, negative aspects, and you hear the uh, questions. What what do you still hold about it? There's a, a good feeling. I've I've made it a point. I've had the opportunity to travel in a n number of nations, um, preaching, preaching conventions the last several years, and so I make it a point to ask in the nations uh, to the leaders how they feel about it, and the church feels good about itself. Leadership feels good about itself. As I was asking our overseer in Argentina about it, and uh, he was just thrilled with it. And he said that it has changed in Argentina. In Argentina, a Latin American country. A Latin American, very, very straight. And uh, he said that uh, that they were known as the Don't Church, and that's what they were known as. And he said this has given a whole new image to them. The overseer of France told me. Said, now, who is the overseer of Argentina? Can uh, you recall his name? No, I, I can't recall his name. I, I can see him, but I can't recall his name. But also, when I was in France, I, I asked him, and uh, he said they perceive it since it deals. Is more, Andre Weber? Yeah, uh, Andre, Andre, mm -hmm. yeah, 
he's still there. And he is, um, he says that this new is, teaching is more, more strict, and it was more well received. It was well received in Europe because of it dealt with the drinking problems, and mm. that was a problem in their society. And and mm. so he felt. So there's a good feeling about. It. The only check that I have is I I am I am observing some younger ministers who do which what I've heard you talk about that we have a tendency in our denomination, I guess any church, and that's the pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. and some of them, I think, are, I, I told them in a prayer conference in Southern Ohio the other day that uh, I said, uh, we, we are a pendulum church, and when we were over here, I was considered a, a liberal, and now over here, uh, I'm considered a conservative. And I said, I haven't changed positions. <laughs> I'm still where I was all the time. I've had that same experience. And, and I've gone all the way from being liberal to being conservative. Yeah, that's, that's where Preaching I, the same thing. Same thing. I've gone from liberal to being conservative now because I do have some concerns that we have a tendency to a pendulum swing. And that some of these, uh, I think it's a minority, but I think some of them are reading it as a license to, uh, to, to be less... Uh, disciplined and committed than they should be. Mm -hmm. And that bothers me, but I think it's just something that, that comes out of that kind of decision making. Mm -hmm. Brother <clears throat> Nichols, in the uh, range of leadership, of which I have uh, begun to make uh, a study, and I've spoken that at our School of Theology, and at some of our other uh, colleges, the, the whole range of membership, of leadership, has to have a lot of different uh, facets to it. There are those who are uh, innovators. They start new things. And then there are some that are energizers. They are the ones that are able to really beat life, bring life, breathe life, preach life in, into whatever is at hand. There are some that are uh, reactors. They, they respond to critical, uh, critical things. Now, you are a man that has so many marks of these and other marks of leadership in you. And I happen to know some of the confidence that some younger men have toward you and older men have toward you, you stand in a very, very remarkable place because you have not surrendered convictions. In uh, your view then of the future, in your view of uh, the old and the young, what do you see? Do you see a growing division? Are we how are we going to be able to convince the older people that we are not changing and yet be progressive enough to show that the, uh, the younger men, that we are responsive enough to the needs of the time that we can meet the need? You're, you're in a place of top leadership as Assistant General Overseer of the Church of God, and that is going to be one of the big things that we have to do in this immediate time. To do that, I think, uh, I think we have a beautiful model in uh, going back to the practical uh, commitments in the new document, we call it, that if you can involve people in the decision-making process and not just impose it upon them. That, you, that day's over, isn't it? Yes, that day is over. And, and uh, if we can develop a strategy uh, for instance, at our General Assembly, where we really practice what the early people wanted the General Assembly to be, a place of discussion, a place of exploring, a place of uh, opportunity for uh, uh, searching. And, and if, we, if we can develop that, ad, it, you know, the General Assembly may be too large to do that if we can break that down into smaller groups, but be inclusive of people taking ownership of the direction that we go. 
I think that would be a tremendous thing. And uh, then it's, uh, so much of it is going to depend upon the, the um, attitude of the older people. The greatest hero I have in the Bible is Samuel. Samuel was rejected by his people at the end. They, they said, I think they compared him with Eli and they wanted him mm -hmm. and, and they began to accuse his children. And, and then he was the man that was in spiritual leadership when they changed their whole structure and they went from prophet to, to king. And um, he pleaded with them not to go in that direction, but they, they went. And the, 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 uh, he's one of my heroes because he, when it was all done, and when they accepted the king, and when they went against what he wanted them to do, he said, I will not sin in failing to pray for you, and I will teach you. And he established a school of prophets. Mm -hmm. And he, I think his latter years were probably as productive mm -hmm. as any time in his life mm -hmm. because he was able, even though people did not do what he wanted to do. He did not abandon them, mm -hmm. you know. And so many of the people who have deep roots in these areas are going to, ha are going to see things that are really going to disturb them. But it's going to be so important that they not abandon and that they do not sin in ceasing to pray and teach, because mm. that's the only two counteractive things that you have to air. What a very fine analysis. I appreciate you sharing that with me. <clears throat> and I also appreciate your coming by and having this conversation uh, with me. I've been talking with uh, Dr. James John Nichols, sorry. Dr. John Nichols, Assistant General Overseer of the Church of God, a man of long-standing experience and effectiveness and integrity. It's just been a delight to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank for you for the invitation. It's been a delight. <laughs>